be uh, hanging out after the frame that we're going to smash. So um, briefly, a little refresher on virtual memory for you guys. Um, so what's a frame? Uh, don't confuse it with a stack frame. Uh, I think we're pretty much done talking about stack frames for today, OK? A frame is a physical memory backing of a page, OK? A page is a chunk of virtual memory. Pages do not necessarily have to have frames associated with them at all times, OK? And so, so I've, I've given you a little drawing here. Uh, so we have two processes running on our, on our little virtual system here. One of them, ha and both of them, by the way, have stack, data, and text, OK? These are, and they each have um, one page for each. Each virtual memory address space, you know, virtual memory address spaces composed of pages, physical memory composed of frames. So the, so here's what memory looks like to process A. Uh, text is there, and it's backed by a, a physical memory frame, all right? Data is backed by a physical memory frame. Stack is backed by a physical memory frame. Process B is the same process, OK? It's, it's just the same program, which means that it can share the same text frame, OK? Uh, so the page, both of those pages map to the same frame. And it's read only, so it's OK. Um, process B hasn't been run in a while, and data has gotten swapped out to disk. Sorry, process B. Uh, its stack is still in memory. Um, and so, so what's important about this? What's important about this is that the Linux kernel has both physical frames. They ha it has a whole bunch of physical memory mapped into the address space. And it has whoever used to be running, whoever, whatever user land process used to be running, it has their, uh, it has their user address space also mapped in. And this is, this is to make context switches faster, blah, 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 take, take an OS course, right? Um, but the, the upshot of this anyway is that you need user memory to be accessible if you want to do things like read, write, ioctl. Uh, and you need, you need kernel memory accessible if you want to do frame allocations, you know, to get a DMA buffer for the hard drive, for instance. OK, so, so that's right. So that was controlled target. Uh, now, now we know how the, um, how the buffer allocation works a little bit. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about the next issue of our three controls. Issue the issue is obvious. Crash is inevitable. Uh, control number two is the length. Okay. Um, so we know that writes take place through that sprintf to a strange place, and we can't we can't stop it. We don't determine how long it goes because that sprintf is just a fixed length format string, and even if the thing that we want to smash is in the middle, it'll just kind of keep going off the end. So we'd hope. We can't stop it before it overwrites something else important later on, OK? And um, here's our third control. Controlled contents, OK? What are the contents of the buffer? And so remember, remember in our elementary exploit, the contents were the letter A a whole bunch of times, some shell code, and then a return address. But we don't control that, OK? No data comes directly from me in this exploit. No data. All of this data is formatted through sprintf. So what's, the, what's going on here? We're 0 for 3. How are we going to exploit this? Well, OK. Uh, it's time to start controlling our environment. The environment is not, you know, the environment isn't set up for us to control. It's time for us to start taking control. And uh, so let's go for it. Um, how are we going to control the target? Well, let's go for an old-fashioned heap spray. The, what's, what's the idea behind heap spray? The idea behind heap spray is that we're going, to, we're going to scatter a whole bunch of things around memory, and we're going to just hope and pray that the things that we want to, the thing that we want to smash shows up after the buffer. And the way that that's going to work is we're just going to litter memory with, the, with things that we could potentially smash. Um, so. Uh, what are we going to spray across the heap? By the way, target practice, Emor Havel Heavy Industries. With Emor Havel, your target is our target. Um, so the first idea for things that we could smash, a kernel stack. We know how to smash stacks. We've done that before. It worked, you know, it worked really well in that little easy gets exploit. Um, we know how to smash kernel stacks. We just overwrite a return pointer and let's go. So uh, let's keep an eye on that here. 
So let's take, let's assume for a little while the best case scenario, okay? Uh, the kernel stack, all right, um, the kernel stack is going to be in the frame after the sysfs page. The heap spray worked, so it goes there, all right? And the other best case scenario is that we know what process ID that kernel stack belongs to, okay? So we know who to yield to to make this execute. Given that, given those, given those two kind of best case, what happens, right? What does a kernel stack even look like? Um, I got a picture for you. Like, so like other stacks, like every other stack in the world, a kernel stack has stack frames. Don't confuse these with physical frames. Kernel stacks live in physical frames, but they have stack frames. Um, like other stacks, a kernel stack has stack frames, all right? Uh, so what are we looking at here? We have, we have some guy's stack there, right? This is, this is um, there's a thread control block, the stack grows down. So we go down from the top of the stack frame, okay? There's more stack frames, register save space, and then a uh, return address. Return address, I like return addresses. I can trample on return addresses. Okay, there's a bit of a problem here. There's a bit of a problem. Um, kernel stacks have another thing in them called the thread control block. A thread control block kind of describes a thread control block describes what state the thread is in, and threads, I guess, in Linux, we call them processes. But a thread control block describes what state the thread is in, whether it's runnable right now, who its children are, who its parent is, what address space it lives in. A kernel stack has a thread control block attached to it. Every thread has one kernel stack and one TCB. By the way, these addresses are bogus. So let's take a look, okay? Let's take a look at what happens when, when we write when we're going to smash the string buffer. Um, so we have our sprintf. This is kind of a simplified sprintf, and it's, it's got all of our text, and it's going to go from the string up. Um, so in order to get to that return address, we've got to hit the thread control block. OK? When, whenever, we, whenever we write, the thread control block is clobbered. So by the way, this isn't the end of the world, OK? This isn't the end of the world if we clobber the thread control block, and here's why not. Um, if, if we have control of the data, okay, then we can write something that would have been a valid thread control block into that spot. And it might not have been valid enough to keep the system running for hours and hours longer, but it would be valid for long enough, you know, for us to switch to that thread and uh, hit his return address and take control of the system and then drop a root kit and reboot the machine or whatever, right? Well, we don't have control of the data. This time we just get ASCII characters and not even ASCII characters that we control. And uh, best I can tell, a thread control block, well, you, you just can't do one of those with, with those specific ASCII characters. So, so this is dead in the water, all right? This K stack idea, not gonna happen. Well, what else are we gonna do? There are other things that go in physical frames, one of the, but the, uh, the big important thing, I think, that goes in physical er, frames is controlled by the slab allocator, all right? The slab allocator is a central memory allocation structure in the kernel, uh, and they switched to that actually probably late 2.4. And the idea behind the slab allocator is, in a kernel, you create a lot of objects that are about the same, okay? You create a lot of objects that are about the same sort of thing. And so what we're gonna do is to reduce fragmentation of having a whole bunch of differently sized objects, we're gonna localize every object that's similar in memory, okay? Every object that's Every object of the same type, we're just going to pack into a frame, and now we have frames full of these objects. Um, right, so these caches are frame size. Sometimes they can be two frames long, but, but there you go, right? And, this, and so not only is this uh, better in terms of memory fragmentation, but it's also better in terms of performance because of the algorithm that uh, they use. So this was originally designed by the Sun Microsystems guys. Uh, I, think, I think it was probably Jeff Bonwick. Jeff Bonwick does everything. Um, who... Um, who described this in a paper, and they use it in the Solaris kernel, and they have some paper showing like a ridiculous speed up under load in the kernel. 
So let me, uh, let me show you a little bit about inside the slab allocator here. What's inside of a slab? Okay, so by the way, each of these lines is a frame boundary. I don't know if you can read that text there. But each of those lines is the boundary of one physical memory frame. And the way these slabs work is that they have a fixed number of slots in them. In this case, we, uh, these are huge objects, one kilobyte large. Um, but you fit n of them into, into a frame, okay? And so from somewhere outside in the world, there's a pointer to the first free slot in each slab that has free, that has free slots. So when you want to do an allocation, you go, okay, I'm going to follow this first free slab pointer, okay? To find a slot that I can a slot that I can allocate, and so now where do we now sooner or later we're going to have to update that pointer so each free slot has a pointer to the next free slot available, and since they're all the same, it doesn't we don't have to do any kind of best fit allocation, first fit no they're all the same, so we just take the absolute next slot available, or if there's nothing left right the pointer goes to null there's nothing left available in this slab, then then we just take this slab out of the list of slabs that, that we can allocate from. And the idea is that we want to fill slabs and we want to keep, uh, and we want to empty slabs also. We want either full slabs or empty slabs so that we can release a frame back to the system. Uh, so where's the list of slabs available? Slab metadata is stored in a slab. It's a whole bunch of stuff of the same type. Well, where's the metadata for that stored? And stored elsewhere in memory, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, okay, so what's important about this slab thing to us? Why am I spending so much time talking about it? Uh, what's important about it to us? Well, there's no header on the front of a slab. The, the first thing in the frame in a slab is the object, all right? Very first thing, we can see it right here, and my drawing is perfectly accurate, because drawings are always accurate, is an in-use object, okay? This is convenient for us. This is really convenient. We can just kind of drop that string there. That, that would be a good place to drop that string, I think. All right, who uses slabs? Well, I'm not sure if you can read that text from all the way in the back, so I'll read it for you. Um, but every, every kernel subsystem uses slabs, all right? Every kernel subsystem uses slabs. The, so I've done, I've done a little grep inside of the Linux kernel. Uh, for every time we call this the main slab entry point, uh, kmem cache alloc, kmem cache alloc, and they call it cache alloc because they're allocating caches. And um, they're allocating uh, objects from a cache. Uh, so how many, how many times does that show up? Well, there are 305 times in the Linux kernel that we call kmem cache alloc. You know, that's not that they're all unique, but so how many different types of slabs are there available? Well. The developers very nicely gave us some uh, debug info that we can use, okay? Um, in, and you can try this at home if you want on your own Linux uh, machine. You can cat slash proc slash slab info. Actually, it's, there's some very interesting uh, data in there. And there are, um, as it turns out, on my machine sitting uh, back in my dorm room at school, um, there are 183 different types of slabs. Both, any luck, one of those is going to be an easy target, right? I'm going to pick completely randomly something that just so happens to work. Um, and um, let's hit file descriptors. It's very easy to create. Why did I choose this, by the way? It's very, very easy to create file descriptors. And each, and you know, from a user space perspective, a file descriptor has a number, right? Um, FD number. Uh, that's what you get back from the open syscall. But those numbers have to map to something in the kernel. And they get a whole structure associated with them. Those are called struct file. And unsurprisingly, there are a lot of them in the kernel, so it's really a good match for, um, for a slab allocator. So we store these struct files in slabs. Um, what's a struct file look like? Well, I'm going to give you the first couple of fields there that are interesting to us. There is a union that's this linked list, which the kernel guys decided to call FU. Um, and really, it's two pointers for all we care. There's, a, um, there's this path structure uh, that's saying this is the path on disk that we opened it. And morally, that's also 